Welcome to your fifth and final section of the unit on the Progressive Era. Today we're going to be talking about women uh, for the second time, but more focused on women and uh, their achieving the right to vote. Now, as we stated at the end of Section 4, the huge election of 1912 pitted one Republican versus another. Roosevelt coming back from Africa to run for president under the Bull Moose Party, uh, running against current uh, President Taft, who just wasn't doing anything that Roosevelt had hoped he would do, was, was not quite reversing progressive uh, acts, but definitely not moving forward with anything progressive. And then we have Wilson, and Wilson's a Democrat. And because of the split Republican Party, uh, the Democrats uh, do win, and it's the first time in 17 years that a Democrat holds the office of president. So Wilson gets in, and Wilson actually becomes more of a progressive than Taft want, uh, is, and uh, he institutes a new financial package. Uh, the, the section is called Wilson's New Freedom, and part of that new freedom is his idea of financial reform. So Wilson literally picks up where uh, Roosevelt left off. It's almost like Taft didn't even exist. Um, you take those four years of Taft's presidency out of the way, and it's like eight, nine, ten, twelve years of progressive reform from Roosevelt to Wilson. Uh, this quote by Wilson is interesting. It says, without the watchful, resolute interference of the government, there can be no fair play between individuals and such powerful institutions as the trusts. Freedom today is something more than being let alone. I want someone to ask me in class, uh, after watching this uh, vodcast, I want you to ask me what this phrase means, resolute interference. It's interesting uh, how Wilson uses this term, interference. Typically, that word is a, has a negative connotation. Wilson gets Congress to pass the uh, Clayton Antitrust Act. Uh, this strengthens Sherman Antitrust. Uh, if you remember, Roosevelt went after trusts and got 44 trusts broken up. Now Taft went after trusts as well uh, but and, and did more than Roosevelt. But uh, Wilson picks up where Roosevelt left off. And the difference between Roosevelt and Wilson, Roosevelt said some trusts are good. Wilson says no trusts are good. Let's get rid of them all, uh, all of them. So the Clayton Antitrust Act is passed, and uh, they really go after the big businesses. The AFL, the American Federation of Labor, a huge union in the United States, uh, supports the Clayton Antitrust Act because this act removes or no longer restricts unions, uh, making them no longer subject to antitrust laws. Under the old laws, unions were seen as businesses, and they had to abide by those trust laws too. And if a union tried to gain a monopoly, uh, in, in its uh, specific work area, uh, it could be taken to court and broken up uh, just like a trust could. So the Clayton takes, uh, takes unions off that list, and now unions can become a, uh, what we see today, uh, a very large lobbying group. Another aspect of Wilson's new freedom financial uh, promises to uh, low, low tariffs, uh, bring lower tariffs, which he does. Also, he institutes or uh, introduces the idea of an income tax on families, uh, and this is the beginnings of the 16th Amendment, uh, the amendment that passes income tax on uh, any wages that you earn. You can see at the beginning, anybody making over $4,000 a year was taxed 1%. I would love to be taxed 1% on what I make uh, annually. Um, it's almost up for the, the, the more wealthy in our, in our country. Uh, you can see up to uh, 30 or maybe even 40% of their income is being taxed. Uh, average income uh, gets taxed about maybe 17 to 20%, but at the very beginning it was very low. The most, um, the highest income when this was first introduced, highest income tax anyone would pay would be 6%. And as the government grew, this number grows too. And then the Federal Reserve System, um, was introduced as well. It's a way to manage money and a way to, to uh, keep the money in check. Um, we have 12 district, district banks in the United States, and um, those banks then uh, loan money to district banks, and those district banks give it to your uh, individual bank. Like we have several banks here at Nixa, they get their money from district banks. District banks get their money from, from the uh, Federal Reserve, 12 district banks. And one of our area has its own uh, Federal Reserve Bank up in Kansas City. And this, this system is still being used today. All right, on, now on to the main topic of this section, women winning suffrage. Now we've been speaking on this for many years. In Section 2, we talked about 
uh, how women have been fighting for over 40 years and really have not seen any, any kind of uh, development. Um, in the western states of Wyoming, Utah, and Colorado, women had been given voting rights, uh, full voting rights in those states. And so we're starting to see some movement uh, at the turn of the century in the early 1900s. And they were given the right to vote because of their activities uh, in that individual state. And so the National Women's Suffrage Association, uh, NASA, National American Women's Suffrage Association, takes a look at these states and starts to apply some of those strategies. And they do start to see some gains. Again, this movement is led by college-educated women. Remember, more women are going off to schools. Some women were even gone over to Europe. Um, and going to school uh, in colleges and university there. And while they were there, they get involved in the European suffrage movement. Now, the European suffrage movement was extremely radical by uh, American standards. And so when these young women are coming back from college, getting involved in American suffrage movements, some of the American suffrage leaders like Cherry Chapman, Carrie Chapman Catt did not like that because they said they were too radical. Some of their strategies were too radical. Uh, Catt was very... Uh, uh, very much in favor of going at a, lo a low-key, very polite way, asking the president for a meeting, uh, explaining their desires and their wants for suffrage, and then being politely excused and being okay with that. Well, the European suffrage movement was radical, uh, parading in the streets, uh, sometimes causing riots, you know, destroying property, uh, even. Uh, Kerry uh, Chapman Catt, as mentioned earlier, was the leader of NASA, the National American Women's Suffrage Association. Uh, she led this organization by being organized, tying in the national goals to the local goals, uh, finding ways to raise money, lobbying congressmen, and being gracious and ladylike. Well, this is exactly what uh, leaders of the government want, because if you're gracious and ladylike, you're not going to push uh, the limit. You're not going to be forceful. And so there was really no push or no, no great desire for the congressmen to change their minds because the women weren't going after it. Alice Burns, or excuse me, Alice Paul and Lucy Burns are two women who did attend school in Europe. They did come back and they did get involved with NASA. They are young, they are radical. They ask NASA for the right to go to New York City and, and be a group specifically for uh, pushing for a national uh, amendment. Or actually it wasn't New York City, it was Washington, D.C. And they say they want their, their only goal to be a national amendment, so that's going to be their focus. Well, they, they reluctantly are given uh, credit um, or uh, permission to, to do this, but they have to raise their own money, and they do a great job at it. And they, and they do host parties, and they do host uh, parades. And sometimes, sometimes they do get arrested because they petition and picket in front of the White House. Um, due to their radical behaviors, um, they are stripped of any rights uh, that they may have had under NASA, and so they form a new party called the National Women's Party. And uh, their tactics after they form the new party become even more radical. And in the movie that we're going to watch in class called Iron Jawed Angels, you get a really good first-hand look at how much work these two women did with this party and what they had to go through, physical torture, uh, mental anguish and uh, you know isolation from other women um, just to get the right to vote. Now due to the work of people like Alice Paul and Lucy Burns, uh, gains, huge gains are being made on women's right to vote. Congressmen start to change their minds and uh, start to join uh, the, in, in favor of suffrage, but unfortunately timing is against women in this case and, and war in Europe becomes a major issue. And in the 1919, or excuse me, 1917, Wilson uh, declares war on Germany, and the United States goes to war in World War I. And with that, all, all concerns for suffrage get put on the back burner. So um, most women's groups like NASA respect Wilson's decision to go to war, and they do cut back on their lobbying. The National Women's Party does not. They continue to picket Wilson and the White House during a war. And because of that, they're thrown in jail. Uh, most women do go to work as men are going off to uh, war. They're being drafted for the very first time. The selective service is instituted. The draft is instituted. And so uh, we're, we see vacancies in the factories. We go into wartime production. We need people to fill those jobs, and women do that. And because of their willingness to serve in the factories and help the war effort, and because some women go off to Europe and and join the war effort there as nurses and, and uh, caretakers for the men. Um, that 
gains them a lot of respect from men around the, around the country, including congressmen. And uh, those congressmen who were once opposed to suffrage now are more inclined to vote for it because of women's contribution to the war effort. And um, eventually, congressmen decide that if they want to keep their seats, they will vote for suffrage. And if they don't want to vote for suffrage, then they realize that they're going to lose their seats in the Senate. And in 1919, the first, uh, the, the 19th Amendment is passed, uh, officially giving women the right to vote all across the United States. And that essentially also ends the progressive era at, the, uh, at, the, uh, at 1919. Thanks for listening. Again, ask questions about Wilson's comment and uh, get those notes taken and study. Talk to you later. Bye.